Hello knitters, Barbara Benson here. I'm an independent knitwear designer who also likes to make videos here on Watch Barbara Knit. Make sure to check in the description below where you will find links to all of my social media shenanigans online. You will find where you can get my patterns to knit up for yourself, how to join us at the Watch Barbara Knit Facebook group, and how to support me on Patreon. So today I'm excited. This is something that's been brewing for a tiny bit. I say that a lot, I believe. But uh, about a month ago, I put up a video called, that I named, What Kind of Knitter Are You? And this is What Kind of Knitter Are You? Part D. <laughs> it is the second part because, you know, I just wanted to talk about process versus project knitters and the, then I added in the comfort versus challenge like what kind of patterns you like and what that video was about was about what kind of knitter and what kind of projects you like to do and the discussion the comments on that video were fantastic there was dialogue y'all talked to each other you talked to me and a lot of really interesting things came out. Y'all shared your stories, which I really, really loved because very much so I am sitting in my room talking to my computer. <laughs> okay, that is what I do when I make these videos. I mean, in my mind, I'm talking to you and I hope that comes through, but getting this feedback from you and hearing your thoughts is just, it makes it so much fun for me and very engaging. And some other scales came up in the discussions, people talking about what it made them think of. And in reading the discussion and reading people's comments, I came up with three more scales. Now, because it is three and because they don't precisely line up in a nice axis like the last one did, we're just going to talk about the three individual scales and maybe you can think about where you fall on those scales and um, let me know in the comments below. So the first scale is what I'm calling, and, and this took a while because I had to come up with the names and the scales because I wanted to make sure that there weren't any loaded words involved, judgment words, because none of this is good or bad. None of this is saying this is the way to be and this is the way not to be. So some of the words that I leaned towards were words that had maybe negative connotations to them. And I don't, I'm, I really wanted to try to avoid that when at all possible. So the words I have hopefully make a little bit of sense. Some of them might sound a little, um, scientific or, or sterile, but it's me really trying to avoid any judgment because this is a no judgment zone. You know what? The way you want to knit, you knit that way. The projects you want to knit, the yarn you want to knit, you are the boss of your knitting and I fully support that. And as long as you're enjoying it and you're getting something you like, there's no wrong way to knit. So the first one <laughs> now, the second time I'm saying that, I'm calling the pattern compliance scale. And this is the one word compliance. We're not talking about compliance being good or bad. It's just how much do you stick to the pattern? And what I have found is that there is a scale, a range of people who are very faithful to the pattern, all the way up to people who are very innovative with the pattern. They may not be following the instructions, but they're doing something fun. By faithful, I mean they're going, this, a faithful knitter is going to be using the yarn. They want to use the yarn the designer called for. They may even want to knit it in the color the designer called for. They're going to follow the instructions row by row to a T with sticking to a strict observation of that pattern so that they can as faithfully reproduce what the designer envisioned as they can. And that is fantastic. You know exactly what you're getting. You see the pictures of it and you're like, I want that. 
and it makes total sense. Um, other reasons for people to have this level of faithfulness to a pattern is maybe they're a little unsure of themselves and it gives them comfort to know that I'm following these directions and I'm going to get this. And that is a perfectly fine reason to be doing it as well. And I will tell you, as a designer, when I see someone who has chosen to use the exact same yarn in the exact same colors that I have designed, I'm like kind of like, oh, I got it right. This is great. This person likes what I chose. That doesn't mean that I get upset when someone chooses to do something else. And that is when we get into the innovator, the innovative side of this scale. These are people who sort of see patterns as a, a suggestion. <laughs> it's like, maybe you wanna do this, it's a guideline. It's a general framework upon which they can get creative. They're gonna pick out a different yarn. They are gonna use a different color. They might even substitute in a different stitch. They're gonna make it long sleeve. They're gonna take it short sleeve. They're gonna take the sleeves off altogether. They're even, I have had knitters who have taken a shawl pattern of mine and changed the shape of it. They're gonna add a color. It was a two color piece, now it's a four color piece. It was designed in solid, they're gonna do it in a gradient. They're gonna add beads. They're gonna do a pico bind off. Go for it. That is absolutely fantastic. And I love seeing that because I know that that person has taken what I created as an inspiration to fulfill their own personal vision. And that is fun and fantastic. So we have this pattern compliance scale from faithful to innovative and the whole range and you can be in between you might just change a little bit but mostly stick to it or you might just you know you can be anywhere on that scale it's great so the next one is what i am calling the yarn acquisition scale and it in a way might go with the pattern compliance scale a little bit but this is about how do you acquire yarn? And the scale I came up with is, do you, are you bespoke or do you develop a stash? Now, bespoke is one of those hoity-toity terms, which is described tailoring and couture. And what that means is that that a bespoke item is something that is crafted specifically for a singular person or purpose, that it is a solution just for that one thing. And so I used bespoke because what that means is you pick out a pattern and you pick out a yarn and you only purchase the yarn when you know what pattern you're going to use it in. Or you pick out the yarn and find a pattern for it, but you don't have yarn that doesn't have a special purpose, that doesn't already know what it's going to be. You feel best having yarn in your possession that is paired up already with a pattern because you know that that yarn is going to be. And bespoke can go as far as being, you never have more than the yarn you are working on at, the, at one time. You buy your yarn, you make your project, you're done with your project, you pick out another project, you buy yarn. You do. So at no point are you accumulating any extra yarn. So being a d bespoke in your yarn acquisition. On the other end is our stash knitter. The knitter who just loves yarn. <laughs> that what it is is they find a yarn and it's beautiful or something about it speaks to them and they know that they love this yarn and one day they'll find a pattern for it or not. It's just something that brings them joy and they need to have in their life. And that is just fine. And they accumulate yarn. You know what? Pe people collect shiny rocks. People collect, my husband collects trains. You know, the little, the little model trains. People collect shoes. There are people with incredibly, incredible sneaker tennis shoe collections. They have way more tennis shoes than they have feet, <laughs> okay, that they could ever possibly wear. And you know what? If that's what brings you joy and it works for you, then you go for it because it, it's what makes you happy. 
And having that yarn in your stash might make you feel good that you know at the drop of a hat, if you come across the perfect pattern, you have that yarn and you can start it right away. You don't have to go find it. You don't have to try to find the yarn already because you know you have it in your stash. Or you can go and paddle through your stash like Scrooge McDuck until you find a yarn that speaks to you and inspires you to find a pattern and get started. It's one good way. I know a lot of people who are stash knitters who use it as a way to get their knitting mojo back because if maybe they're a little down and they're not really into their project and they go look at their stash and the yarn inspires them to do something else. Again, back to the flip side, if it's bespoke, there are some people who if they have yarn on hand, it stresses them out that it doesn't have a purpose and they feel compelled to do something with it. And I will say that I understand that because I have run into that when I, as a designer, receive yarn from a yarn company or a independent dyer. When I have that yarn and they gave it to me to make something with, it sits on my shelf and stares accusingly at me until I use it because I've made a commitment to design something in that yarn which is why I, I really don't take yarn all that often because that level of obligation and I'm a little flighty and easily distracted sometimes. And sometimes I just have to go where the mood takes me. So it's kind of funny because I'm on both ends of the spectrum. When it comes to design, I'm very bespoke. I have a yarn, I have the design, I finish it, I start another one. The, the yarn, I don't like having that kind of yarn laying around. When it comes to the yarn loving person in me, <laughs> I have boxes of yarn that I have just because I love them and the color makes me happy. So that is your yarn acquisition scale. Our third and final scale for this video is what I'm calling the in progress scale. And I'm sure you will see how this ties into the previous ones. Well, at least into the yarn acquisition scale. I think I could have made an axis for yarn acquisition in, in progress because I think they might be similar. Now, this in progress is referring to how many projects you have going on at one time. And on one end, we have the multi-whip where you might have multiple works in progress scattered about your domicile. And on the other end, we have the mono whip that you're only ever working on one project at a time. You can see how this might tie into the bespoke yarn acquisition. So you find your project, you start your project, you work through your project, you finish your project. And only after you finish that project, do you start another one? You don't like the idea of having multiple projects sitting around in bags. And you know, you have your reasons for that. In my design, I am very much a mono project kind of knitter because I am easily distracted. And what happens is if I start one and then I get ooh shiny and go to the next one, there's a distinct possibility I'll never come back to the first one. And I need to because I have to finish it so that y'all can do it, get it and knit it for yourself. Somehow I doubt people are going to buy my pattern. If it's like, here's a picture of a half made shawl. I know it's going to work. Trust me, have fun. I don't think that that is going to fly. So I have to finish it. So I have to force myself to be a mono whip. I have to only have one project going at a time. The other end of that scale is the multi whip. It is the knitter who, for whatever reason, likes to have multiple options at any given time. It depends on what they feel like knitting at the time. They might have a sock project in the car and a project that they only take to their knitting group where they play trivia because it doesn't take a whole lot of brain power, but they have extra time and it's light colored because they knit in a bar. <laughs> Or they might have a really complex project that they keep at home that's only for when nothing's disturbing. Or they have a bag next to their couch for when they're watching a specific TV show. Multiple works in project so that they can work on something that they enjoy. Because sometimes you have the brain power to work on something complicated and sometimes you don't. 
<laughs> I know quite a few knitters who always, regardless of how many other projects they're doing, have a pair of socks on the needles. And that's because they like having hand knit socks. And that's a great reason. So I see the multi whip knitter as someone who uh, might be like me, easily distracted, but they can follow that whim that when they get tired of one thing, they can put it down and pick up another thing and work on it. And then they can come back to that original project and it's reinvigorated for them because they're not tired of it anymore. So being able to jump between projects helps them finish them all because they need to have that different stimulation. So <laughs> I think that that is a scale and you may be somewhere in between. You might be mostly working on the same project all the time, but put it down to get something done real fast. And what that is, is that's kind of like, I do see these people where they have a big project they're working on and they are very focused on that project. And then they really just get tired of it. So they do something small, but that small thing, they start it and finish it quickly. So they were still really only having a mono whip because that's the only one they were working on. And then they go back to the original one, as opposed to having multiple unfinished pieces in various stages of completion. But who knows? That is why we're talking about it because you might be somewhere completely off any of these three scales. And I'd love to hear about it. I'd love to hear about any thoughts you might have for other scales we can talk about, or just, you know, continue this conversation to see what kind of knitter you are and what inspires you and where you fall on these scales. And you know what? If you don't want to think about it, and if you don't want to be, you know, pushed onto a scale, you don't have to be. <laughs> You can just say, I knit whatever I want, whenever I want, and it doesn't really matter. And that is just fine too. This is just something that I enjoy thinking about. Um, a lot of times when I'm knitting something that, you know, takes a little while and my brain just starts wandering. So I hope you enjoyed this follow up. Uh, what kind of knitter are you? Part deux. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, click that like button. And if you would like to be notified whenever I upload a new video, please subscribe to my channel and select notifications. Thank you so much.